Hey there, I'm popping in real quick to let you know that if you've ever felt completely lost or utterly alone while trying to navigate life with rheumatic disease, I am here for you. I created an online educational support group program to help you go from overwhelmed to confident, supported, and connected in just four months. It's called Rim to Thrive and registration is open today through Friday, September 13th. I'm really excited to be offering three different groups this fall. One will meet on Mondays at five o'clock Eastern. The other meets on Tuesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern and the Wednesday groups meet at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And if you're on the fence about the Room to Thrive program, don't just take my word for it. Here's what Katie had to say last March. I was lost and overwhelmed with my RA diagnosis. It felt overwhelming to know what to read, what to do, how to spend my energy trying to research on the internet. Room to Thrive did that for me. It's been like getting a crash course in my diagnosis along with a community who gets it. So if you're interested in joining, don't delay as each group is capped at 16 people in order to maintain a small, intimate group atmosphere. And also, registration will not open again for the next groups until spring 2025. All of the groups are open for anyone to join around the world. They're designed for people with rheumatic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or spondyloarthritis, but honestly, they're open to anyone with any chronic illness because I know that there are so few programs out there that offer comprehensive evidence-based step-by-step instructions for how to navigate all the ways that rheumatic disease and chronic illness affects your life. So I also wanted to let you know that I offer scholarships and pay what you can options. So to see all the details or sign up, go to the link in the show notes or the Arthritis Life website at www.myarthritislife.net. Or you can always email me info at myarthritislife.net and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much and I can't wait to support you soon. I'm so excited today to have Dr. Caleb Michu. He is a uh, rheumatology friend of mine who I've known for years online and finally got to meet in person last year. So welcome to the Arthritis Life Podcast. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to have you. And if you could just let the audience know, you know, where do you live and what is your relationship to arthritis? So I am here in Omaha, Nebraska, United States, uh, in my University of Nebraska Medical Center office, where I am a professor. And my relationship to arthritis is so long. (laughs) Can I tell you it was my birthday recently? Oh, yay. Happy uh, birthday. I just turned uh, the big 5-0, and, which means it'll be coming up 47 years with arthritis. So uh, wow. that's my relationship with it. It's been a lifelong. It's pretty much all I know um, mm-hmm. as far as personal experience, as well as the main thing I do research here where it's at the university. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Yes, yeah, so your relationship, you could classify as lifelong <laughs> relationship. <laughs> to our to and, and my main profession uh switched to doing rheumatology research and I focus primarily on health outcomes uh and patient registries and in many disease areas but really focused on rheumatoid arthritis lupus psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and I, I pretty much do everything research with people directly or through surveys that aren't clinical trials and aren't like bench microscope complex, Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, you're really about like what, how we can improve the quality of life. Is that, would that be right to say? Yeah. I love that as both an RA rheumatoid arthritis patient and occupational therapist, that is like what I'm most passionate about as well. And so we're going to delve more into research. So just dangle that in front of everyone. But first let's start with your personal story. You mentioned you were diagnosed at age three, how, how did that happen? And lead me through. So, so I, I did research on this because when you're three, you don't remember so much. And uh, I've spent more time with my parents and talking about, you know, now that I'm a parent, uh, get to say, you know, what was it like? What was going on? And got access to my patient notes back in 1977, 1978 as well. And apparently um, I was limping, I had a major limp um, and they saw I had a swollen right knee. And after so many days of this and then crying and not being able to walk, 
that and my mother just had my my baby sister who was one at this point so i could i had to stumble along while she was carrying a baby uh i was admitted to the hospital they did a biopsy on my right knee and i back then you stayed in the hospital and i would spend a whole month uh november through december um i don't know if it included christmas or not but it was a long time and very painful in which i was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis back then or jra and i didn't know what it meant all i knew that it was very painful and that i had trouble walking and they gave me lots of hot baths and lots of aspirin. So, and I had a big cast on my leg for a while. So that that's how it started. Wow. And um, yeah, you had you gave a great talk at the American College of Rheumatology you know, annual conference last year in 2023, where you had lots of um, pictures from that time, which were really incredible. But yeah, I usually ask people, what was your emotional response to your diagnosis? But obviously you were three. So <laughs> I, I cried a lot. I know that. But I think most of those pictures you saw me smiling because I was getting people to come visit me in the hospital. And when they took those pictures, and I think that was really nice to have friends and family come see me. And then I got ice cream cones occasionally. But um, they, you know, this continued for many years. And I think, um, I didn't realize that the other health problems I had were all com com completely related to my arthritis. Uh, and so, you know, when I was rushed to the ER with a mono infection and almost died, uh, you know, my first experience with a, an ambulance, um, you know, and I don't know if they knew this either, that it was related to having an autoimmune condition that was not in control. And with my only treatment as aspirin at the time and taking up, up to eight grams of aspirin to the point where I was getting tinnitus, ringing ears, breathing problems. And again, I thought that was arthritis related, but apparently that was a side effect to my pills. So you know, in and out of wheelchairs, uh, braces on my arms and legs and having to sleep with them. And you know, this is what they, the state of the art in the seventies and the eighties uh, and then finally getting my first sort of real medicine being gold injections, which were incredibly painful and unclear that that did much. Um, it definitely took a heavy toll on me and my family. And I think what happened to me, um, and emotionally, I think looking back on it, um, I felt, and I was told that I wasn't going to live very long and that, that I, I basically, internalize that that I wasn't which is why it's a big deal that I just turned 50 um that I wasn't going to live past 26 that I needed to do as much as I could while I could and you know and, and I grew up in small town Kansas uh and I I also internalized that I'd done something wrong um to deserve this you know sort of a, a I don't know if, if that's sort of a, a Protestant upbringing or what, but, you know, that I had to figure out and and make up for it in some way. And um, and that was part of my spiritual journey at a very young age. Wow, that's a lot to put on on a child. But I think it is common, whether it's from a Protestantism or whether it's from just, I think, basic logic a lot of times we say okay cause and effect like we do x like i bumped my knee on the on the counter it hurts like i hurt therefore i must have done something right you just apply that logic and um i mean i on, honestly i often use the example of children getting arthritis to say it's not your fault if you get this autoimmune disease out of nowhere everyone wants to think there's a reason and so they can have a sense of control over it or think if i just if I ate better, if I exercised, if I did whatever, I'm like, sometimes your immune system goes rogue and you couldn't have done anything different. And sorry, this is my little pet talk to anyone listening. <laughs> I completely agree. And, and so when people, you know, ask for tidbits of like, what are some of the things I learned? One tidbit, not the current one that I use reference a lot, but was hugely meaningful for me when I was about 12 or 13. Uh, my my father would you know say ts a lot you know when i complain about something and and he would say well life's not fair and 
you know, he wasn't the most friendliest individual, but it, when I internalized that, it was actually completely freeing. The idea that I, I was not, what I did as a one or two year old or three year old wasn't fair. Like I wasn't being punished for whatever I did at even younger ages, like the idea of an original sin. Like mm -hmm. basically life wasn't fair and bad things happen to good people and so on. And good things happen to bad people. And when I internalized that, I was like, wait a minute. I felt so much more freedom. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I'm like life isn't fair. You're exactly right. And I was in such a good mood. People were like, you are weird. I'm like, no, you don't understand how much of a burden this is, you know, for me to be like, I've got to be good all the time to like, I'm kind of like Job, you know, these are the punishments that are going to keep coming and I have to do the best to show, you know, anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's so true. It's very freeing to know that some of it's out of your control. It's scary at first to accept that because you, we, you know, control is like the antidote, a sense of control is like the antidote to anxiety, right? So not knowing that you're not fully in control can lead to some anxiety, but it can also be like freeing you from the burden of thinking that you should have just done something different and this would not have happened. And I, or now that I've had this idea, um, I'm going to add, I actually got a new rheumatic disease um, this summer. Oh no, you're a collector. I know. On the way back from Europe for the European, the ULAR, um, the day I was leaving Vienna, I was in so much pain. I could barely walk. And I mean, normally I would have gone to the ER, like something bad is happening. But I've got this very expensive flight back to the US. I don't want to miss it. Mm -hmm. So I suffered through it. And I get back and I have acute onset gout. Oh, and, not fair. But here's the deal. It's like, fair. I have no risk factors for gout. Like you look at all the things that you're supposed to do to not get gout. That's me. And there's no, like having rheumatoid arthritis does not lead to gout. Like it's not anymore. It's like independent. And so for me to get this additional rheumatic disease, I was just like, what, you know, like, universe. I, would sw I swore a lot. I swore I'm so a lot. sorry. <laughs> That's awful. But, but, you know, life isn't fair and these things happen. And sometimes, I mean, it's just how you respond. You know, it, it sucked so much. But at the same time, like when somebody else said, oh, you've got the disease of kings or queens, you know, like, OK, that's one way to look at it. Right. You know, but yeah, yeah, that's that's so rough that. Yeah, it reminds me when I got a pilonatal cyst, which is like a cyst on your tailbone. They're like, I'm like this, you know, tiny, like 35 year old woman at the time. And they're like. Yeah, this usually happens to like older, hairy, sedentary, overweight men. And yeah. like, we uh, don't, don't know why don't you have any of those things. You're like, right. I'm like, I mean, I have a thick hair. They're like, no, no, we're talking like people who have like back hair, or like a lot of, you know, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, it just happened. It just and happened. Most of the people who got what I got were girls or young women. Yes. And growing up and meeting a support group of young adults with rheumatoid arthritis and similar diseases was so empowering and so impactful, but also a reminder that I was unusual in many ways. Um, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, w you know, you were, we, we started with childhood. I'm going to try to be chronological, <laughs> um, but you know, how, what was it like being a teenager with JIA before this? I know being, a, having, J oh, we call it JIA now, juvenile idiopathic yep. arthritis. Oh, and you mentioned ULAR, which is the European League Against Rheumatism, or they changed the name now, but that's the conference yeah. in Europe for rheumatology. Yeah, it's the big um, one, like 14,000 yeah. people, so it's good. I really want to go. Um, I've never been. Anyway, back to you. <laughs> so <laughs> having- I many was a normal, horrible, all over the place, um, hormonal teenager. teenager. Uh, and I think I hit puberty later, so I was even smaller than I should be. Um, I was, you know, I am very thin arms and that's part of growing up with this. It changes my growth plates. Um, I come from a larger family. And so I know that even though I'm six foot tall, I was supposed to be even taller and bigger. Um, <clears throat> and that showed, uh, I think emotional roller coasters were par for the course. And then, um, 
I, I think uh, so. One of the things I internalize is that I wasn't going to be a star athlete. I wasn't going to be able to do all the things that, you know, what you grew up wanting to do. I said, well, I'm going to make the most of it. If I'm in a wheelchair most of the time or not, I'm going to just move this brain around and learn as much about what the world, how the world works, why it works the way it does, and see how many problems I can help fix along the way. And I was determined to study physics and astrophysics and particle physics and sort of help do that at the most fundamental levels. And that that did lead to undergraduate at University of Rochester and graduate school and, and Stanford, where I got my PhD in physics. But one of the, the many things that they did with this disease is they they said, well, you have to wait till you're an adult. You have to wait till you're an adult until you can start your real drugs. You can wait till you're an adult until we can do the surgeries. And I had my wrists replaced. This is an artificial wrist. Um, you can sort of see that that's not attached there. This one was replaced and then they fused it. So I can't actually, like you can not do that here. Uh, I see, yeah. And that happened when I was 23, 24. And I tried to return back to my lab um, where I was getting my PhD. And the folks were like, you know, this person just tore their ACL and they're back after a couple of weeks. Why can't you be back? I'm like, this is a six month rehab process. And it was not a good, um, it was not a good support group. <laughs> so yeah. I took a leave of absence and went back to small town, Kansas, in this case, bigger town, Kansas, Wichita, to work with my rheumatologist, the one who diagnosed me with JRA when I was three. Um, he says he needed a statistician and I was looking for a reason to come back home um, and have that better support that I needed. And he told me about this data bank called the National Data Bank for Magic Diseases. And in 2001, I joined him as a statistician and for two years, we were just in harmony. Uh, he was still seeing patients, but I would be back there coding and doing programs and doing analysis. And he would come in between patients with ideas or singing opera, um, depending on his mood. And we just had a fantastic time. And I decided, you know what? I want to do this. I'm going to change my research to this um, and make a difference in people who have arthritis apply it to them. People are messy. It's even more complicated than the physics where everything is clean. You've got particles, you control the, the process where people are have so many things affecting them. And it actually became a great source of joy to know that what I was doing had a more immediate effect on the people around me, people that I was meeting. So I went back and finished my PhD changing fields. Okay. Because I was going to say, I didn't know your PhD was in physics. Okay. So it started yeah. out in physics. And then what did it become in? It stayed physics because oh, okay. in order to switch fields, I'd have to start over for many more That's years. That's what I, I thought. That's Yeah. And so I took a whole bunch of other courses, but I kept the degree in physics. And they basically said, you know, as long as it's heavy enough in the numbers and algorithms, it's okay. Just don't teach physics anywhere. I see. Okay. So it was more in like such statistics? And epidemiology. Yep. Ah, Okay. I love uh, people. I'm sorry. I'm always thinking of episode titles as people are talking. So I'm listening to you, but also part of my brain is thinking about titles. And I'm like, people are messier than particle physics. Oh, <laughs> <That's my name. laughs> people are so messy. Like in physics, we 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 pride ourselves in approximating everything so you can get an answer. Like, okay, imagine a horse and a horse. Like you because you basically make the horse into a sphere, and then you become you know interactions. <laughs> And people, you know, there's so many things that affect our day, like in the last hour um, and how, what you're feeling and how you're processing and, and what, why you make the choices you make. And this is exactly why marketing exists, mm -hmm. right? They want to know and why economics exists. They, they, it's, it's the sort of the study of how people behave yeah. and why do they behave that way? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, I find that very fascinating. And so um, I remember you saying in the at the your keynote talk at the conference last year that you had for for many years, you know, performing and helping with research in the rheumatology world, but you are not talking um, publicly about your you being a patient too. And that's yeah. always 
that is a common topic that comes up in my like room to thrive support groups and just comes up in the podcast and people's journeys deciding when and where to quote unquote kind of come out to pro- to borrow language from the gay community lgbtq like when to when and how and whether to do that in different contexts whether it's work or home yeah how to what was your thought process around all that <laughs> So with work, I was surprised because I went to this American College of Rheumatology conference in 2001. It was a huge conference in San Francisco. And I, you know, I'm going as a new entry to this whole world and learning so much and really enjoying it. And I'm seeing some patients, a few patients there interacting and they're treated very differently. And I'm seeing this again and again. Um, and then I had one patient person who was a patient who was there at the conference come up to me and like, so how long have you had it? And I'm like, oh, you know, I was, I was priding myself on having it be invisible. And and I kind of upset me because like, damn it, I, I didn't want people to know that I had arthritis. I didn't want them to be able to tell because I was in my mid 20s and I, you know, single and <laughs> and. And then when I told one rheumatologist there, he immediately went into, oh, yes, well, I can tell now because like, he's examining me and looking through me. And, and then he completely dis, discounted anything that I was presenting at the poster. And it was more sort of focusing on me and treating me very differently. And this happened, you know, a couple more conferences I went to. And so I basically learned not to say anything and to hide it as much as possible. I also learned to do the same thing dating, uh, because if you bring it up too early, it scares people away. Because like, okay, I don't, I don't want to deal with that um, as well. So that was another, yeah, unfortunate aspect of being single and trying to, yeah. No, and I think we're. It, it's amazing how much has changed. I mean, a lot of things have stayed the same too. But you know, I think there's a lot more focus nowadays, and in on like disability pride and like being able to be, you know, open about things. And I think there's for a long time been more of a, you know, back and back in the day, not to say you're old, huh? I'm 43, I'm turning 43 next month, but you know, are you really? Is, yeah. When you said a long time ago, 35. I was like last year. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> like, okay. I'm trying to think, actually, I, think I had Charlie when I was 34. So yeah, that was 30. Sick, okay. whatever. Yeah, yeah. I know it's the it's the skincare. It's the it's the sunscreen. Being being anxious about getting a sunburn has led to me looking younger. <laughs> oh. Our our as people with these diseases have better skin. I think so. I think in I, general, in general. I also think I have a little bit of a loose connective tissue, so I think uh, apparently that helps with yeah. Aesthetic. I was told that this was a real thing, and it's due, especially. I mean, I've had a lifetime of NSAIDs. And it's related to NSAID use. Oh, like, okay. Well, I did not know that. So. It's not medical advice, anyone listening. <laughs> but um, but with dating, I think um, I'm wondering if also like you are, you know, a straight male as far as I know, and I think yep. there are different expectations on you know men than than women, and and so I wonder if that you know gave you felt made you feel different pressures and stuff. I never liked to hide who I was, and so I revealed this fairly early in dating or conversations, but it was always like knowing that when it was going to come out to see what would happen, because, you know, we were like, okay, well, very nice to meet you and have a good life kind of thing. And that would often happen. Um, it was, I mean, I get angry and life's not fair kind of thing, but it's, it is what it is. Like you have every right to not want to have to deal with that in your partner. Mm-hmm. And, and I think for me and others, and, and this, it's very much a real thing. If somebody else has the same condition as me, it's even stronger as a repellent. Um, we understand each other very well. Oh, yeah. But for having kids and the idea of a family, you're like, well, you kind of want somebody else who can be there when you're having a bad day or vice versa. And you, I mean, I don't know about you, but maybe unconsciously, there's this thought that I really don't want to have kids have this issue too. This this is what's weird about me being a very optimistic person. It literally didn't cross my mind. <laughs> I, because I would say when by the time I got pregnant, I was one of those like they were my my I had been heavily medicated and successfully medicated for rheumatoid arthritis for the 10 years before after my diagnosis before I got pregnant. I did have one medication 
fail, quote unquote, after six years. And so I had to switch to a new one. But my idea was very simplistic about how I was going to manage my RA. I was just going to keep taking medication. So to me, it was like, right. And we're, we're living in the best era ever for rheumatoid arthritis treatment. So yes, I understand that my child has, instead of a 1% lifetime chance of developing RA, they have a 2% chance still it's unlikely. And like, I, it kind of, it crossed my mind, but it wasn't at all. I, I, I think I, that's weird. I think most people think about it because at least in the support groups and stuff, it's definitely come up. I was just like, that's fine. Yeah. Like, I mean, and, that's just me. and part of me felt bad because like some of these people who have the other conditions, I love dearly and are some of my closest friends. Um, but I think, you know, when I was looking who I was looking for in a partner was probably, yeah. Anyway, so I, I was more sympathetic to people who were like, I didn't want to see me again after I told them. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm, I'm yeah, it is, it's your right and your choice. Um, well, but it's also like one of those things where you can't, you can't change it. You couldn't change it. It's kind of like, so seeing yeah, but... somebody like who wouldn't date somebody with a certain skin color or certain, I was like, yeah, I mean, it's your preference. It's not something I agree with, but it's sort of like, I can't. Yeah, but disability is the only minority group anyone can be part of at any time. So I feel like to me, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to put my eggs in the, a basket or assume that just because someone's able-bodied today, they're going to be able-bodied right. in five right. years. Exactly. Like, exactly. I mean, I know, and this has come up a lot with a lot of people who are like, maybe they're. Uh, I'm thinking about a couple of people in the support groups where like they were actually the most able-bodied one in their relationship and they came down with severe you know, case of uh. rheumatoid arthritis after the birth of their third child. And they're like, okay, so I made all these life choices based on this assumption that I'm doing, I'm going to be fine. And then my, maybe my partner has a chronic illness. And now it's like, we're both in this boat and it could just happen to anyone. Right. So, but that's the investment that you put in and your, I mean, see, yeah. people break up after that still. Whereas yeah, if I tell somebody early or like we've been dating for a while, I think it hurts a lot more when there's attachment and yes. then having the other person realize like they're, they're not willing to be in it versus early enough where it feels like, okay, I'm not attached. So if they make this decision, like that's okay. very true. It's not as personal. No, a hundred percent. And you're so right that unfortunately having a partner with a dis or one, someone coming down with a disability or having a disabled child mm -hmm. is a unfortunate predictor of divorce. Um, but yeah. yeah. And you, but now you're, you are okay. Now I, I want to follow this thread actually, if that's okay. And then we'll go back to the research. So we will not that's forget. <laughs> but so how did you meet your, you know, your wife? Uh, we met at a research conference in Chicago uh, in 2011 at the medical decision-making conference. And I was working with some researchers at Boston and Minnesota, and she was getting her PhD with the group at Minnesota. Nice. And I remember meeting her and asking her to join the other groups. And she's like, no, you go on. That's fine. <laughs> but she she said, hey, why don't we talk a little bit more? Because she wanted to learn more about rheumatology. And they were doing something outside of their normal field with looking at cost effectiveness of the biologics. Mm -hmm. And so we stayed in touch on that project. And uh, she asked if she could visit Omaha. I said, yes. And I gave her the tour and uh, about six months later, we decided to start a relationship. So. Wow. And, and now she's you... now, uh, she's a faculty here as well. She does research and trying in the public health, trying to help people prevent them from getting diabetes and prevent, uh, help them quit vaping and smoking. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Those are two tall orders for sure. Um, but that's like critical research. Uh, that's amazing that I know with being academics, it's very hard to both get jobs in the same place. So that's. And we're big nerds and we're proud of it. I mean, this is what we do every day. Um, our kids both have the same initials Aww. of the medical decision making meeting that we met. <laughs> oh my God. This is amazing. I feel like this is a MDM. Rock in the making. What yep, is it? Yep. MDM. MDM. They both have MDM. Yep. Oh, I love it. I love that. That is so adorable. Um, and I do, I want to, I know that people are going to uh, wonder about, you know, what was it like? A lot of times the people I have on the podcast, you know, for rheumatoid arthritis are more commonly women than men. Um, and just yeah. statistically, they're and affected. also they're affected more. Well, and I think I'm on social media a lot and a lot of women potentially are more open with, you know, sharing their stories and stuff there. But 
Um, you know, what was it like for you when the, when the kids were little, was it hard, you know, on your joints, on your hands, being able to pick them up or fatigue wise? <laughs> I mean, it's hard it for was, everyone having babies. Like it period. was, it was horrible. Um, but it was kind of, I mean, I'm laughing about it now because it's, it's like, they're six and eight years old now, um, which is a huge difference than when they were yeah. born. But, uh, I, I don't do well if I don't get a good night's sleep. Me I too. Flare. I flare. And I, I can't function. Uh, and so being there in the same room and supporting the baby who needed to be fed all night long, we were both miserable and I was useless. And so um, after a couple of nights of that, I'm like, okay, well, I need to sleep in a different room. I need to get a good night's sleep. And um, then things were much better. And I, I, I basically, I'm a researcher. I talked to lots of other um, friends who had babies and a lot of them were not doing very well. And I think a lot of the women were complaining to me that the men were not doing enough around the house, not doing enough to help. They felt that they were more on their own. And so I promised my wife, I said, hey, you know, as long as you are breastfeeding, uh, I will change the diapers. Now, I didn't realize how big of a deal that would be when but I I'm said I'm laughing it. just because that's really hard when your hands are hurting. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that, one. Uh, and two, what I learned the hard way is that once, especially when they're in daycare, um, they get exposed to a lot of things. And I wash my hands a lot, but I got exposed to a lot of things. So I was getting sick all the time the first couple of years. And so everything they had, I had, it would it would just be a cycle. And I'm like, this is, I, I've never been sick so much in my entire life. Um, so, and I didn't stop when she stopped breastfeeding. So I kept on going because I think she just got expect used to me doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it's, but I, it's really hard. It's like one of those things where everyone thinks that they do like 60% of the household labor. Like it's really hard to have that sense of that you're both equally doing stuff. Yeah. And I, I think one of the stories I talked about last year was before we decided to have kids, my rheumatologist saying, well, you've been on methotrexate for so many years, we're going to have yeah. to go off of it for six months and then freeze your sperm and then you can have babies. And I'm like, what? 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 Why did I just freeze them after methotrex after being on methotrexate or after going off methotrexate? They weren't okay. It has to be out of your system long enough because, you know, the, oh. the studies, the old studies showed that it was spermogenic and, and also caused some other issues. And, okay. and I'm like, I, I don't think this is true. I don't, I think there needs to be some studies on this. And I encourage almost all the studies have been looking at women. And it's, it's a very much known thing that methotrexate is. A, I mean, it's horrible. Tetrogenic. Is that the word? Tetrogenic? Tetrogenic. Tetrogenic. Yeah. I wasn't sure if I should say that, but I mean, you, you, I mean, it, and a lot of people lost access to that when Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. was um, removed last year because it's seen as a possible abortive drug mm -hmm. because of, that's how bad it is mm -hmm. for taking if you're pregnant. Um, so for men, there's a lot of similar assumptions uh, that it would cause bad things, and but they hadn't done research on it. They'd only done it in rats in the oh, 70s okay. and 60s. And... Uh, I basically, this is where you're being optimistic. I'm like, I'm looking through and reaching out to all the men that I know who've been on it. And I'm like, okay, everybody seemed to be okay. <laughs> we'll go with it and, and ignore this advice. And first child, no problems, no issues along the way. And then after she was born, there was a paper, first paper published showing that there's no association with, with bad results with men taking it. So I'm like, I felt <laughs> redeemed. <laughs> but it also was a bit of a roll of the dice and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I so think I went with... against my rheumatologist orders. Okay. I know. There's we all we all go rogues at, at some point. Um and yeah, so you mentioned the importance of research. I do want to loop back because um I would love to give you a chance to talk more about the National Data Bank and forward and just what what are the types of studies you're doing and how can patients get involved? So it's called Forward, and we have a website called forwarddatabank.com or forwarddatabank.org. Um, it used to be called the National Data Bank for Rheumatic Diseases. And mm -hmm. I changed the name a few years back because it just wasn't very easy to say. Yeah. Um, so 
And the reason we call it forward is because keeping that optimistic tone, we want to move forward. We send out questionnaires to people with these conditions and they answer questionnaires twice a year. They're not short. Uh, and we have little monthly tidbits that can come out instead. But what happens, and we've been doing this since 1998, uh, we have you know over 10, 20,000 people who participate around the US from these questionnaires, we learn what works and what doesn't. We learned about how bad pain is, how bad fatigue, how bad sleep, uh, the different joints that are affected. Uh, get advice from them, uh, you know, physical function, all of all of the different treatments. And as I try to tell the fellows here who are getting the rheumatology fellowship here at Nebraska, um, it is very possible that each of your patients will find a cure that works for them. Our goal is to learn from them and learn because it doesn't always apply and work for the other person, people around. Like, mm -hmm. why are some things working? Why are some things not working? Um, and it's not just to roll the dice, like some people say. And this is what's been going on for 25 years. And from this, you know, like 600 papers, tons of collaborations. And we provide anonymous data that you provide to researchers around the world. Uh, and we try to provide a lot of it back to the participants because it is participant driven. Uh, yeah. People who have these conditions go through it, put the time and effort in, and we want to make sure it's useful and valuable for them. But I will tell you, I mean, I used to, you know, poo-poo research like this, but the more we get participants to answer these questions, the more we can learn. We've learned so much from it. Yeah, I just can't, I can't sing it praises enough about it. It, was it poo-poo because it wasn't objective enough because it's quote unquote just patient? Oh, yeah. Active. Oh, yeah. I yeah. was definitely drinking the, yeah, I don't, um, you know, the rheumatologists I work with, they always say, oh, it's got to be joint counts. It's got to be the sed rate or CRP. It's got to be things that we do with the patient. And that is true to a point. But I can also tell you that answering 13 questions is much more predictive of your future than any joint count and blood test. I, I, it's unfortunate. I wish it was the other way around, but answer those 13, 13 questions have shown time, time again to be more valuable to showing your future prognosis than those other things in the clinic. Well, and, and I would argue also that tender joint count is also subjective. Like, oh. I mean, I Without have, so, I always yeah. have a hard time answering that to my doctor. Cause I'm like, well, yeah, it, it's kind of tender. Squeeze harder. Like, okay. Now yeah, it hurts. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> um, so I find that hell, I, I, it, anyway, okay. I'm going to stop myself from going on a, on a tangent, but the point is that, yeah. So if you're a lot of people listening, a lot of people in my kind of online community that I've come across, they really do. They are looking for not just, it's hilarious that they're looking for like the opposite of what the rheumatologists are looking for sometimes. Okay. Obviously we all want our disease to go into remission and to feel no symptoms. That's like goal number one is to get everything feeling better. But assuming that you're not a hundred percent there, you're like, what can I do? Like, what can I do to reduce my fatigue, to reduce my pain, just practical everyday tools. And, um, it sounds like that your questionnaires might lead to other researchers being able to I, tap that's into right. that. Yeah. And, and it is true that people who participate in research studies like this do live longer and do do better in general than those who don't. But, you know, I, I, I mentioned this this last week, a little bit of tongue in cheek. Um, it's because in some level, people who don't are sometimes doing so worse, so poorly that they can't participate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or those who choose to do it might be more reflective and might think about how they answer the question. as like, you know, I don't think about this very often. Now that I'm thinking about it, I am noticing some things here. I wonder if you know, addressing that might help these other conditions or help these other areas. And that has been known to happen. And I know that it works for me at some levels. Uh, I don't like answering lots of questions all the time, but if I do it every six months, I feel like it's sort of like, okay, there's some mm -hmm. important things that happen that I can be a little more reflective of. And especially the question about the global, they call it patient global, um, considering all the ways your yeah. condition affects you, rate how you're doing. And there's so many things that are affecting me. Like, how do I put it all in this little hundred point yeah. scale? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's, it's, 
really hard. I mean, as, as an occupational therapist, yeah, everything that we, well, well, you do have some objective measures, but a lot of times it comes down to a lot of qualitative, like, you know, making degrees of improvement and, and not, not, not necessarily having these like massive, um, objective numbers like you might see when they first came out with the biologics where people are like, whoa, I went from like every joint hurting to none of the joints, you know, and I'm looking at the research library on the website right now. And like, for example, just to give a couple examples, there's like the publications that have come from this research, um, you know, or the, the data, the data bank is like the impact of menopause on functional status in women with rheumatoid arthritis that has been coming up a lot. That's and, a big one. And yeah. I, it, it really sort of draw drew back the question of, I'm sorry to cut you off there. Is no, that, please. No, I was going to ask you more about that. Should we be re revisiting getting hormone replacement therapy with women with rheumatoid arthritis going through menopause? Um, and some people, I mean, because we're finding, even though there was reasons for it not to have it, but the huge impact of your hormones on your disease activity. And, you know, what is the best approach there? Because, you know, we've been, we as a group, of patients in general have been punished in the past by the cardiologist who took away some very good therapies because they caused heart attacks in people who did not have any inflammation. Uh, but they were actually really good for those of us who did have inflammation. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm speaking about Vioxx okay. back in the day. And oh. that was great for people with RA and inflammatory conditions. But if you were OA only, it was definitely increasing your heart attack risk. But mm -hmm. anyway, I think hormone replacement therapy is one of those similar things where overall it caught in slightly uh, increased the risk for cardiovascular events. Um, but they rarely look at the subclass of people with RA and inflammatory conditions like this. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, anyway, there's, there's more research to come out of that soon. That's no, one I was of just, many. I was just linking that in the show notes if people want to learn more. But yeah, what are some of your favorite like current like publications or historical things that have come I'm out currently them. looking at cannabis cannabis use more and more people are feeling comfortable talking about what they've been trying what's working what's not uh and i'm I, i'm very excited about what the future holds there even though it does feel like we're still in the wild west and we're far away mm -hmm. from you know where it will be as a source of pain relief not necessarily disease activity relief but if you can help yeah. control some of the pain, because some of the pain we have is not going away once our disease is under control. And it's very yeah. frustrating. Uh, as somebody yeah. who is sort of low disease activity, uh, I can be in a lot of pain from what is basically become like OA and other issues that are just come from a lifetime of, of RA. Now, when you say, how do you measure disease activity when you're saying? Uh, from from forward, we do it primarily through uh, the PASS-2, or sometimes people call RAPID-3 tool. It's, it's the the global, like considering yeah. all the ways you're doing, uh, the pain and physical function and averaging those together. Yeah. And that oh, works for people with all conditions, not just room arthritis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. No, I think I remember you, you presented a few times on cannabis in the last... Uh, or maybe it was the last couple of conferences, they all start blending together. But um, it is something that people ask me a lot about. And I I still feel a little um, like, I I don't, I'm definitely not an expert in cannabis for for pain by any means. So I'm like, you know, there's starting to be more um, access to like nurse educators that have like special training in cannabis and stuff like that. But um, certainly the patients seem to, you know, so many use it as an important tool in their pain toolbox. Yeah. And I'm not a proponent either way. All I know is the U.S. seems to be far behind other countries because mm. of the legal status. Interesting. Um, yeah, and yeah. what I hear from patients and people, especially people in other countries, is that it's uh, titrating the right dose of CBD and THC on the individual level. It's like pure personalized medicine mm. to help people really control their pain from whatever the reasons and subsequent anxiety that comes from it so yeah i love the fact that it can work on both like yeah it can help some people cbd or cbn or whatever you know there again there's so such complexity to it but some people use it for sleep some people use it for anxiety some use yep. it for pain and um so yeah it's great that again like you know oftentimes i'll hear patients say stuff like um well Okay, well, this is opening the can of worms of like diet, but sometimes they'll be like, 
I'll say, well, you know, the research is really clear, like that, you know, medications have the, you know, you know, best likelihood of putting your disease in remission. They'll say something like, well, it's because like, there's a lot of money in pharmaceuticals, but there's not a lot of money in like diet, you know? Oh, which... <laughs> oh I wish it was the other. Yeah. So first of all, feel free to get on any, some of, of the best DMARDs yeah. that like methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine and other ones aren't promoted, even though they work so well, because there's not big money behind them. So that statement is true. There's a huge difference between a new drug that's on patent and what you'll get pushed versus an older one that's been around that we're getting new science on one. one. Two, there's actually a ton of money when it comes to nutrition and dietary products, and they're not under nearly the same amount of restrictions in what they can advertise and see. And I've been to other countries and you see this very unusual where you watch TV and you have commercials that look very expensive, nicely produced, for supplements and they're showing these supplements as curing them of everything and oh, wow. you know that's not true but you can't tell um but the that country has different rules where they're allowed to do that for supplements and you can do that here as well but they're not allowed to promote any prescription medicines which is what they do in the u.s which is unlike other countries i didn't know that that they were able i, I thought the countries that didn't allow promotion of uh, or commercials for pharmaceuticals also didn't allow promotion for There's supplements. a mixture of that too, but overall you see so many more things that are basically supplements that look like they are the best thing. And mm -hmm. the doctors are constantly fighting against this because there's so much more money in the supplement side of things. That, and that is, okay. Yeah. I, I need to do a whole episode on this because it's really, Agreed. it's really fascinating from a psychological perspective. The natural is better. Logical fallacy really seems to be very tough for people to overcome. Um, and I totally get that. I, I felt that way in many ways, but it I had to experience it firsthand. Like I had all of my childhood and young adult life. And then finally, I'm turning 2021 20, and I finally go on methotrexate and it was like a whole new world, whole new world. Well, I feel like if I were, and I asked this to Lena Anderson too. So this was like a couple of years ago when I had her on the podcast, but it must, I feel like if I were you or her who had, you know, experienced much more severe uh, joint issues from their condition than I have, because I was put so early fast aggressive onto the biologics plus methotrexate, but I feel like I would be bitter towards the people who choose not to take the medications like you don't understand like i, I don't know maybe you're a better I person mean, everybody gets to have their feeling i had a very close friend who was diagnosed with lupus and she said i'm gonna beat this with holistic approach only natural ingredients natural diet and not, you know i'm like power to you i'm happy for you but i'm pretty sure you should take hydroxychloric but it's like nope no nope, i'm not gonna take that poison uh two, three years later, she had a flare, was in the ER. Um, and after switching lots of rheumatologists to try to find someone who would, you know, help her do the way she wanted to. And she was on hydroxychloroquine and prednisone. And she's like, I was so naive. Like, this is so much better for me. And I almost died because of it. And, you know, I'm glad she's okay. And she's actually gotten a lot better with another therapy since then. But it's unfortunate that she had to suffer and go through that to, to figure that out because people like want to experience it at some level. It is it is really tough. And I I'm I don't mean to be I don't mean to be flippant about people who yeah. make the choice not to that it is for me, it is all about in whether or not that choice is informed. If you have all the information accurately in front of you that's not biased and you choose not to medicate, that is totally fine. I respect that. And that's obviously not my choice. It's your life. But I think what kills me is seeing people who think they have, they're informed, but they're actually been informed by bias information. Get evidence. Get yeah. Evidence. That's right. That's why we need research. <laughs> that's right. That's but, right. I can't. Yeah. And I the mean, people who do research and read the research are going to be your better for physicians for you as well, because they're going to be a little bit more on top of why it is better and not just doing what they're told. That's so true. Well, okay, and I'm trying to be mindful of time now. Um, you know, we, should, we should totally talk again because yeah, I we definitely we should. Yeah, <laughs> yes, this is just part one. But um, what are some of your favorite self management tools? You know, today that you use. So 
I think by far the most important one is how do you get a good night's sleep? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is, is so important. Um, so once, and one of the ways I ended up doing is I, I, again, I don't fit the bill for this at all, but I found out um, complaint from friends and partners that I snored. Yeah. So I got it, did a sleep study and it was a horrible experience at the time, but I was diagnosed with uh chronic um, obstructions, sleep apnea, mm -hmm, obstructive mm -hmm. sleep apnea, um, OSA, and got a CPAP machine. And I hated it and I refused it. And I sort of fought with it for a couple of years. But when I found something that finally worked, um, it's been revolutionary for me. And that question about how much time in the morning when you wake up, are you stiff and sore? Like, not at all. Wow. That was for me. That was for me. But that was huge for me because you know i got a different bed different pillows different routine definitely no caffeine after four o'clock you know mm -hmm. you know really watch your alcohol consumption um because alcohol affects your sleep quite a bit too but in the end that was the biggest contributing factor for improving my sleep and overall health uh That's was amazing. that it helps my other... mood so much too sorry yeah, yeah. and then stuff. the other thing for me because i've i've got torn meniscus and OA in the knees over the, my life and my you know, my feet have been reconstructed and all that kind of stuff. Um, getting good shoes and good orthotics, something I still am struggling with a little bit, um, but I'm also trying to postpone knee replacement until I was in my 50s. So I guess I can start thinking about that. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. We become shoe connoisseurs for sure. Getting good chair. I mean, depending on what you do. Um, getting, I have a wrist brace that I take with me just in case I need it. Things start to get painful. Uh, cause once the pain starts, it usually is a sign of it's really going to get bad soon. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of watch my weight. Uh, that's also sort of, I know that everything is worse when you're overweight, but also my body, my knees, especially tend to be very sensitive to how much weight I'm carrying. Mm -hmm. So we're carrying a heavy backpack. Like yeah. I've had a little bit of back pain this week and I'm like, wonder what happened? I'm like, oh yeah, I, sh I don't need that heavy computer. Right. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Things like that. Just sort of listening to yourself. Like what, where is it coming from? What's working? What's not. I really think that patients that live with these conditions after a while should have like an honorary occupational therapy degree because you really do become like so well-versed in, in, you know, ergonomics just through your own pain. Yeah. My yeah. Oh, we're the same mouse. I sideways think. mouse. I love yeah. it. So <laughs> this is a Logitech, um, but it's nice. basically sideways, so I don't have to and have an ergonomic split keyboard that's worked for a while. I, I, yeah. I prefer if I had keyboards just hanging down by the side of my chair, but they don't make at least not handy. Um, yeah. I think also for me, I do uh, a little latte cappuccino in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and people are like, why are you mentioning this as part of your self management? It's like, it really is amazing what it does for my pain levels in the morning. Um, and it's, and I learned from the, neurologically that it's better to get it two hours after you wake up. So your brain can wake oh. you up first okay. instead of being, so you don't create a dependence on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I find that I'm, I'm really good for the day. And I, occasionally I need something in the afternoon, early afternoon for like tea or something, but yeah. I also think maybe just. I, I mentally potentially that that can be like a, you're almost like a self care. Like I'm having this delicious, you know, cappuccino, um, potentially for me, at least I like, I'm a I, creature of routine. So I, I like never it. drank it until we had kids though. So, oh, and, oh, I was so stubborn. I was, I was like, I never going to drink ca coffee. I know I'm never going to be one of those people. And then for me, it was <laughs> grad school and grad school. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> this has to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> grad school you're like hey you we were diagnosing you with some a, a twitch it's related yeah. to caffeine and stress so you need to reduce your caffeine and stress i'm like i i, I got my dissertation in six weeks what, what am yeah, I you're like no <laughs> maybe and talk to me in six weeks yeah <laughs> exactly exactly okay so for rapid fire um do you rapid fire questions do you have any best words of wisdom for newly diagnosed patients uh Talk with, I mean, get a good rheumatologist. I mean, they probably diagnose you, but make sure you've been diagnosed by a good rheumatologist. 
and find a good fit for you, hopefully nearby if possible. And reach out. I get reached out by a lot of friends who have friends or family members who were recently diagnosed. And, you know, listen to others who've gone through it. Um, grain of salt. You know, some things are going to apply, some things won't. But be open and be open to the idea that things will change, but they don't always necessarily have to change dramatically. Um, because there's horror stories uh, yeah. that you hear about because those ca those carry. But the the ones that where people are doing pretty good, maybe you may not hear about as much as well. Hundred and try to, if possible, attitude is everything in my mind. Um, try to find some support and reasons to have a good positive attitude, of, even if things feel horrible and down. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I was gonna say a thousand percent, but I was like, I can't say that. Just on the who does statistics. <laughs> um, do you Point have a favorite? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite book or movie or show you've watched recently? Oh, I used to do a, movie, a weekly movie night. Um, oh, I should, oh, oh, there's so many. Um, I, 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 I've been listening to a song okay. on repeat quite a bit by uh, uh, Glass Animals called Water. Because okay. it combines sort of my love of sci-fi with sort of synth pop. And that has mm -hmm. been very catchy. And the kids have been enjoying it quite a bit, too. Um, love it. I I um, was a big fan of Andor, the Star Wars oh show. Oh, my. I love that. So good. Sorry, shout in the mic. I microphone. can't wait until season two, the final season comes out. But I thought that was sort of, as a Star Wars fan, uh, it's just fantastic. So. And I... I didn't even know all the lore of Star Wars. I just think the act, the main actor, Amandor, of course, I'm forgetting his name. He's so captivating. I'll watch him in anything. Like, yeah, Cassian is. Um, yes. And then I think, I mean, my favorite movie of the year, without a doubt, is Dune Part Two mm -hmm. in the IMAX and possible. Being a theme, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I still listen to a couple of songs from the soundtrack to my kids, like, is this Dune? And like, yeah. before it cuts to the end to the credits, some of the sounds and what and the sort of Mediterranean um, North African theme music that that Hans Zimmer brings into it it's just it gets so emotional. It just and the I, theme of that, knowing that here's somebody who's not necessarily a good guy, he knows that what the decision he's making is going to be bad for a lot of people, but also feels like he's obligated to do so. So I really enjoyed wow. all of that. So, so so good. When you said your song in your head, I thought you were going to say Sabrina Carpenter Espresso. Don't don't put don't put it in my head. Because you mentioned Cappuccino. Head. Sorry, sorry. Her album's really good though. It came out last week. Okay. My daughter's a Swifty, so I get plenty of those oh. things in there too. You know that I went to both nights. Oh yeah. Seattle, right? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um. Uh. Now I'm gonna. This is a new. This is why I didn't tell you about beforehand. But just because I know that you love board games, do you have a favorite board game, or is it? Too I, do. Hard to okay. I do. I do. Um. Currently, it is Castles of Burgundy uh, by Stefan Feld, who's a German. Um, they have a special edition version of this, and it's just so beautiful. The components are so nice. It's such a good thinky board game, and it just passed Terraforming Mars is my now my new favorite, but otherwise oh, it was Terraforming Mars. Okay, so. Terraforming Mars is on my list. Uh, I, have, I don't yeah. have it, but um, awesome. I love it. That's so great. Um, do you know the game Ascension? Oh yeah, the card yeah. game. Yeah, the, the card game. Builder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I play it every day. I, there's two friends on my iPad. Oh, just you have that. That's turns so funny. Dead. That's what we did on the air. We our family went to Japan this summer, and we played it on the airplane a lot. So funny. my kids are constantly like, "Oh, you, this person's winning." I'm like, "Ah, oh, you would, uh, don't be so sure." I have some good. Yeah. No, you never know till the end. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So last one. Um, this is a hard one, but. What does it mean to you to live a good life and thrive with rheumatic disease? Uh, it, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. Okay. It doesn't mean you don't suffer. It doesn't mean you won't have horrible days. It doesn't mean everything's going to be great. Uh, but in my mind, for me, I made a decision many years ago that I'm going to live a life of purpose uh, and my purpose is to help make those people around me, their lives better, people with these diseases, their lives better. And I get up every morning knowing that this is part of my purpose and that I want to say, you know, 
in a few years or if something happens to me and I'm gone, that Caleb Mishu helped rheumatology, helped people, patients with these diseases get better and learn more and do better. Um, and then, you know, the other side of it is I want to make sure that people are finding board games and, and, and finding things that they can be passionate about, whatever it might be, to enjoy those days that we do have. Wow, that is gentle arthritis friendly claps. I'm giving you gentle arthritis claps. That was my job. I could never slap. I, yeah, mean, I could I, never no, slap. I, I had to clap instead. Like, <laughs> oh, I know. I'm I'm, I'm fun, barely functionally able to snap. No, that's that was beautiful. Uh, yeah. Wow. I'm gonna let just. I'm just gonna leave it there. Let that let that percolate. Um, where can people find you online? I, I'm on X at Dr. Underscore K. I was an early adopter um, and on LinkedIn and then forwarddatabank.org and forwarddatabank.com. Uh, and then you can find my name on lists of lots of places too. Yes. And for those who maybe don't, aren't in the know, X is the new name of Twitter, formerly, formerly Twitter. And there's a lot of, I've noticed a lot of, uh, researcher and academic kind of engagement there patients as well but uh the 10 the patient community i've connected with more frequently is on like instagram but i don't think you have an instagram but yeah i run a board game cafe on instagram and that sort of separates the two from me was, so. yeah that's a good idea that's what have it have a separation between work and life i don't do that myself but i recommend uh -huh. it for others <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much again we have more to talk about in the future i'm sure um and it's been just totally a pleasure chatting truly a chatting pleasure with you. yes cheryl thank yeah. you and i look forward to chatting again sometime in the, in the future yes you too okay bye bye for now have a great weekend you too thank you so much for listening to another episode of the arthritis life podcast this episode is brought to you by Room to Thrive, an educational program I created from scratch to help you go from overwhelmed to confident, supported, and connected in a matter of weeks. You can go through the pre-recorded course on your own, or you can take the course along with a support group. Learn more at the link in my show notes, or you can always go to www.myarthritislife.net. And if you like this podcast, I would be so honored if you took the time to rate and review it. I also encourage you to share it with anyone you know who might benefit from it. I also wanted to remind you that you can find full transcripts, videos, and detailed show notes with hyperlinks for each episode on my website, www.myarthritislife.net. If you have any ideas for future episodes, or if you want to share your story or wisdom on the podcast, just shoot me an email at info at myarthritislife.net. I can't wait to hear from you.